tell. So we're just going to start with a little warm up as usual. So everybody get comfortable, get your, out your drawing instrument and paper. We're going to first pay attention to our posture. Take a deep breath. Think about how we feel sitting, where we're touching the chair, the weight of our body. Our back is straight. How we're holding our shoulders so we're comfortable. And then how we're positioned on the table or whatever writing surface, if it's on our lap or out in front of us. Relationship of that surface to our arms. We're resting maybe our wrists on it, maybe our elbows. Just noticing that, no right or wrong way. Just want that to be comfortable. We start touching the pencil to the paper, noticing the pressure. And as we move it, the smoothness, the resistance, how hard we're pushing down, the speed that we're moving. The tightness of our grip on the pencil. I'm going to no try to notice all those things. I'm going to mute people, unfortunately. Unfortunately, I think sometimes they come in with the mic open. Our attention right on the pencil point. Again, attention first on our body, how we're sitting, how we're positioned. When we move the pencil, lots of things to note about how it's moving, how we're pressing it. Our attention right there on the point of the pencil, right there where we're leaving that mark on the paper. If our attention wanders away, we'll bring it right back to that point. And we'll keep our awareness. Awareness open, knowing that we're doing this, knowing that we're drawing these lines. And our attention right on that point, like riding a bike, the attention moving it forward like the pedals and the awareness kind of steering us. We notice a little judgment in that awareness. Watching our eye, brain, hand system, making this feedback loop. Somehow guiding these marks. Something deciding when a mark should start and where it should start and how far it should go and when it should end. Not questioning that, just seeing that it's happening. Being aware of any other feelings that are coming up around that. Letting them move through, just keeping our attention right on that pencil point. Deep breaths, a deep breath. I want you to notice, especially when you arrive at the end of a mark, not to make a decision, but just see if there's a feeling associated with why it's ending and where it's ending. Then observing that return and the restart, that whole time when the mark is all done, there's been some sort of decision, 
and we're coming back again. We're making another line, another mark, letting them move. Slowly turning that, that awareness, <laughs> slowly, slowly turning that awareness around. Just trying to watch that process, that creative process going on. Don't want to get in the way. Keeping attention right on the pencil point, right where that mark's coming out. But being aware of something happening, something playing, something moving. And let your hand just move where it wants to go. Enjoy it, really. Go to that joy. That's where we should really start. It's fun to draw. Be free, let it come out. Look, wow. Where did all that come from? Doesn't even have to come with an answer. Just kind of enjoy the wonder of that. So um, tonight I'm gonna let you draw, even last week we did improvisational, tonight you're really gonna be out there on your own. So you can keep making marks or you can start a new page. If you have a practice, you can do your practice. If you wanna be free and draw what you want, that's okay too. But I do expect you to be making a drawing. And I would like it if you would do the reading as we discussed the last couple of weeks for yourself later. And as a preview for next week, uh, if you're confident enough, share it with the group, either online or maybe in the drawing bee. And if the whole sort of hour is too much to just be doodling around, I'll give you a little prompt, which I don't usually do in the class, but it's appropriate for tonight, a little mini prompt. And that's circular, the mini prompt tonight is circular. So if you wanna work with that, if you need a little starting point, that's a good one. I wanna address one thing that happened last week. Uh, uh, there was a question about Nama Rupa and uh, I, I gave incorrect information. I said something about audio dharma and that was not, not accurate. <laughs> anyway, uh, if you're interested in Nama Rupa, which uh, I did spend some time going further into it and investigating, uh, and uh, it's a really, it's an even bigger topic than I imagined. So it might come back around, Nama Rupa. But uh, if you want a, a, a talk, which I really enjoyed uh, in my search through some of the information, it's on a site called Dharma Seed. It's really a, kind of a blessing that we have these two big sites. Uh, with so many uh, Dharma talks on them, but Dharma Seed is a, is a, the other or another site with tons of Dharma talks. And the uh, teacher is Stephen Batchelor, uh, who I found did, did, you can find three and four day um, seminars on Nama Rupa, but he did a very good talk about it uh, and compared some of the Advaita Vedanta, some of the uh, uh, notions of Nama Rupa from the Upanishads and Nama Rupa from Buddhist uh, path. So anyway, I wanted, wanted to put that out there that the Stephen Batchelor talks on Dharma Seed or the place where to, you can proceed. Okay, so tonight I'm gonna to talk about um, maps and in one map in particular. And uh, I think it's very natural to wonder when you're doing this, like what the heck am I doing? and is it working for me or am I good at this or am I, am I getting my money's worth or is it worth my time? When I would uh, go to uh, online retreats or I'd do online uh, work with the teachers and then we'd spend 10 or 15 minutes in silence, just kind of getting in the headspace. I think this is a really good gig because you could just have everyone sit silently. <laughs> I'm constantly judging the value of this. So uh, it's, it's natural. We want to feel that there's progress. And locally, you know, if you're given two points, there is a sense of progress when we move uh, from one to the next. And because we experience change over time, 
uh, or we have increasing desires, or maybe we're competitive. Uh, we have this tendency to linear, linearize. We have a tendency to try to put everything uh, uh, one after the other. Uh, but it turns out that this map uh, that we're going to look at tonight is circular, not only in whole, but really in every component of it. Uh, and so when I'm talking about the stages in the ox herding pictures, the tendency is to think, where, where am I? How far, how much have I achieved in these? which is a natural thing. Uh, but uh, I, uh, that's not particularly Zen approach, which is kind of where the map comes out of. They, they are, they're uh, not into this uh, staging map. They really want you to see that uh, you have these stages, you've been to all these stages and that you're, each stage is its own thing. Each stage is self-contained. Each stage in the map is self-contained. So instead of marking where you are along the path as a reward, you're really invited to find yourself, find your experience that you've had that's similar to what the stage describes. Uh, try to remember your experience if it reminds you of something at each stage. And then uh, as you see the larger circle and you know the path better, your experience just kind of gets a little more clear. The map is kind of time relative. It's another interesting fact of it that um, there are these 10 stages, but uh, at the same time, uh, you could go through the whole thing in a minute or in the course of one mark or in the course of one drawing, you could go through the whole map or maybe your whole, you know, life is moving from one, one time around the circle or maybe a day is around the circle like that. You can find uh, circles within circles, the way the map is, little loops inside bigger and bigger loops. And uh, also the more clear seeing, the more experience you get with it and the more you start, sort of perceive these uh, steps at, at each point as you're doing the creative path uh, will bring more clarity. And so that the rhythm of moving around it, whether you uh, are moving uh, around it in each mark and then in a, a section of a drawing and then in a whole drawing and then in moving from a drawing to a drawing, this rhythm uh, that kind of gets established becomes really part of the path. It becomes a, a really nice way to move through. And when, if you become stuck at some point or feel stuck at some point, uh, it's a nice way to refer to where you feel stuck when you discuss it with someone. Uh, say, oh, uh, you know, I'm stage four, I feel like I can't get past, et cetera. Okay. So the 10 drawings that are, uh, that, that are referred to as the 10 ox herding pictures are more like 10 perspectives on the same thing, but they're presented as this kind of step-by-step. -step. And when I uh, interpret it into the creative process, uh, yeah, you do feel like you move sort of naturally one to the other. So it does, it does feel like uh, you're getting somewhere, <laughs> but you'll get, you'll get back to the beginning but then maybe a little with a little more clarity. So, and the maps themselves are not unusual. Uh, uh, in Buddhist teachings, there's lots of lists and there's lots of uh, hierarchies and there's lots of maps. One that um, I started with a while back was a book called Mastering the Core Teaching of the Buddha by uh, Daniel Ingram. Who, uh, some of you may know of Daniel Ingram and he was around a group called the Buddhist Geeks and he gives oftentimes podcasts and uh, was very big on the progress of insight path. Uh, that was a Theravada Buddhist path called progress of insight. Uh, and he uh, teaches it as kind of a achievements like stages, almost like video game achievements or something like that. So there is, there is that uh, view if you're looking for it. Uh, and then there are other maps that are that come out in popular culture, like uh, the hero's journey, which is often seen in uh, popular films and things like that, where uh, someone goes out into, uh, you know, the unknown territory and finds a prize and brings it back. Uh, and these maps are sometimes adapted to spiritual uh, journeys. And there are even um, visual maps. Uh, uh, Chuladasa has a, a book called The Mind Illuminated, 
Uh, and in the front of that book, one thing that really attracted me to his teaching, and in the Mind Illuminated is where a lot of the um, ideas about the bicycle, the attention and awareness that I talk about come from. It's very, he has a very good discussion of this balance of attention and awareness, which is a, a great uh, meditation practice. In the very beginning of his book, he has a map and there's a monkey and an elephant and the the monkey is like our monkey mind always jumping around and the elephant is kind of our, our body moving steadily through so and there's pictures there so there are there are precedents for visual maps uh, uh, to enlightenment uh, and also many artists john dato lori who i've talked about who did the book called the zen of creativity did a map uh, and he actually went and reinterpreted some of the original uh, zen ox drawing uh, pictures from the Chinese uh, and the uh, very well-known avant-garde composer John Cage uh, did a series of drawings uh, and published a book on the Zen ox drawings and this path. Uh, and so it's, and it, it's not unusual throughout history because this comes from quite uh, old, I think it's Sung Dynasty, quite an old uh, time in China when these drawings were originated. And over time artists uh, and very, a variety of artists have interpreted uh, these drawings for themselves and made variations of them. And so if you look online, you'll see lots of uh, variations of it. Uh, and then when I uh, got to going in, uh, in Drawing Your Own Path in the book, uh, I felt so strongly about this map that it, I realized that it uh, was a, a project for me in the book. That's where I did the most original work in the book was coming up with my own uh, reading of it, which I'm gonna give you a good bit of tonight. So the ox in the uh, Zen ox drawings, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna put up the screen already. I'm share this. Okay, so here are the 10 Zen, I mean the 10 ox pictures of 10 ox drawings. They go by different names. Uh, these are, this is just one interpretation, although it's a very popular one where there's this little guy, this, it starts off in the upper left, a very young guide. All drawings are in circles. And it goes down to the lower right when the, sort of the person is, gets older and older as it goes, it becomes an old man. So it's sort of showing a lifelong path. Although, like I say, it could happen in a quick time. It's not a, not a set time for it to occur. And the ox in these ox herding pictures is uh, are the meditation practice uh, or the liberation or the goal of meditation, you could think of it as. And in the creative path, the ox, uh, this un, in the beginning unseen thing that gets discovered, uh, you know, is our, what we want from art. It's that, it's that good drawing that we talked about in one of the classes, that good artwork that elusive goal of something that we, we're drawing and we want, we're just thinking something's gonna appear on the page and it's gonna really look amazing. It's, it's kind of desire-based thing that we want to happen. That's, that's the ox. The ox is this thing that, that we want out of it. So, so maybe we go into meditation because we want to end suffering or maybe we want to be less stressed. That's, that's the ox. And, uh, yeah, once we find this uh, clear way to practice, yeah, we, we can get clarity and you'll see this in the teaching. So I'm gonna begin uh, with the beginning. <laughs> uh, which is the search. Okay, so the search, I had to think a good bit. And what I have on the pages here is uh, on the left is my drawing and on the right, uh, sort of down below the words, is the um, frame, the Zen ox drawing frame. And then I have the little uh, poem that I wrote. Every um, stage of the Zen ox drawing pictures uh, has a little poem associated with it. So I'll read some of those and I'll read some of mine. Uh, and the beginning stage in the ox herding pictures is the search for the ox. Uh, so what is the search in uh, art? 
what is the search in creativity? Uh, and I thought about it quite a bit. And uh, what I decided on was curiosity, but you could also think of it as wonderment or enchantment. Uh, there's that, there's that, just that inkling that there's something out there or we see something and we want to know a little bit more. And so my drawing is kind of a diagram of the mind kind of moving all directions and in some cases kind of hooking into or grabbing onto little things. And in the ox herding pictures, uh, there's the, the little guy sort of, wa he's wandering around, he's seeking. And it says, in the pasture of the world, I endlessly push aside the tall grasses in search of the ox. So he's in search of the, um, in search of peace of mind or in search of enlightenment or enchantment, that kind of thing. Following unnamed rivers lost upon the interpenetrating paths of distant mountains, my strength falling and my vitality exhausted, I cannot find the ox. That's the, that's the beginning. You got, we sort of get frustrated. We, sometimes we come to meditation and we come to art uh, yeah, because we're frustrated and we're looking for something. That, that's the ox. That's what the ox represents in these. So I think curiosity really, for me, it's a, it's a, it's a positive. Creatively seeking, mind awakening, curiosity energizes the desire to make. We get, we get curious about what can be done, what we could do. Like I see it in my kids when we have the parts of some, we take something out of a box and we have the little dividers and the box itself. And then they're into more interested in playing with the parts, the packing materials and the parts than they were in the, the object itself. They, they're, they become curious. And I think that's curiosity is where it starts. That's the beginning of the past. So we all feel a little bit curious in the beginning. What can we do? There's also that nervousness. Yeah, when we begin to make drawing, we're curious to see what'll appear on the page and at the same time, maybe a little nervous. Okay. The second stage uh, in the, oops, jumped ahead. Okay. Second stage in the ox herding pictures uh, is called discovery of the footprints. And you can see the little guy He's seen the footprints, aha. Uh -huh. And I interpret it, the second part, after we become curious as taking initiative. So it's a little bit more than curious, but we haven't really kind of done anything yet. So creative energy will not dissipate. We get, we're so caught up, we get kind of get excitement. We get a little bit of excitement around what we wanna do. We think, oh, maybe I will make a drawing. It's a little bit more than should I make a drawing. You think, well, maybe I will make a drawing. So the creative energy just keeps going. It goes over and over in your mind. And in this case, I say, suddenly I see the media and the methods I resolve to undertake the work. So I'm done with art, I quit art, I'm never gonna draw again. And then, uh, hmm, what if I put paint over a rough surface? What will that look like? Ah, and in this stage, I'm ready to take initiative. Sorry, was there a question? No, okay. I just heard a noise. Okay. So now stage three, perceiving the ox. So we've gotten past just seeing the little footprints. You know, we, we, we thought that there might be something and we looked all around and we kind of got exhausted, about, couldn't find it. And then we did discover some footprints. And in, in the second stage, when we discover the footprints, maybe we Maybe we see an artwork in a gallery or we see an artwork on online in a picture or we see an artwork, uh, uh, you know, in a museum. The first glimpse or the perceiving the ox is where we actually see, we actually get a little return. So maybe we've, maybe we've sat down to meditate for the first time and it felt pretty good. Or maybe we made some marks, we're not scribbling anymore, but we see something. We see, get a catch a little glimpse of, oh, that's not bad. I think that's not bad, or that was kind of fun. We feel a little bit of relief. So that's the next step. After we've decided we're interested and we're gonna do it, and we kind of start to do it, ah, there's a little bit of relief in that. This is kind of the honeymoon phase. And in the first, uh, three, one, uh, one, two, three steps of the ox herding pictures are really kind of the precursor to actually doing the kind of like the, there's like a beginning, middle and end or a, or an input processing outputs stage. Uh, 
So one, two, three, we're just getting into it. We're just catching a little bit of fire. So I say, now the page is no longer blank in the first glimpse. You've made your tentative marks, sketchy lines, overcoming hesitation and shyness. The goal is far, but the journey is underway. And uh, in the Oxharding pictures, he says, I hear the song of the nightingale. The sun is warm, the wind is mild. Willows are green along the shore. Here, no ox can hide. What artist can draw that massive head, those majestic horns? So we see the challenge there as well. We see, hmm, we can't ignore anymore that this is a path for us. We can't ignore anymore that we need to be doing this. We sort of have that, we sort of just start, we're getting committed here to doing it. We understand there's something there for us. So sometimes we go to a lecture, Dharma talk or something, and maybe we meditate, uh, they have little meditation at the beginning and we kind of get into it and we think, ah, this, this is something I could really start to get into. That's, that's stage three. But just in a simple, like that, I'm saying that more on a longer time scale, but just on a simple drawing, uh, those first marks, that's the first glimpse. That's that cosmogenic moment that, uh, that uh, Paul Clay talks about. That's when you start to perceive the ox. You have the first glimpse of your drawing when you make those first few marks. And there's, as we know, there's a lot of, uh, every other drawing that could possibly occur is eliminated. There's a lot of change when you make those first marks and there's a lot of judgment around the first marks because some, I've known people to make two marks and throw away a piece of paper, uh, possibly me, uh, because uh, somehow I projected forward the whole drawing anyway. So there's a lot of energy around the first glimpse. Okay, next stage. It's catching the ox. Uh -huh. Now the little guy has his hand is right on the tail of the ox, grabbing it. So stage four, we pass the warm up, we pass the honeymoon. Now, but we're right at the beginning of getting underway, so we still have a long way to go. And I say, seeing the thing that looks like the thing that looks like nothing I've ever seen. To get something working in the drawing, I move outside the ordinary. So we start to we start to do stuff. We start to feel uncomfortable. We start to try and make it work. The ox herding pictures say, I seize him with a terrific struggle. His great will and power are inexhaustible. He charges to the high plateau far above the cloud mist. Or in an impenetrable ravine, he stands. Okay, so this, the ox again, is this meditation practice. And well, we've caught it, but what happens when we first start on meditating or on drawing? What happens is that, you know, it's tough. <laughs> Our mind is busy. We're uncomfortable. We think we're wasting time. We don't know. All these doubts, all these fears come up. Oh, this doesn't look like anything. I'm, I'll never be a good artist. All, all these things. Okay. This is in this catching phase, but we caught it and we're working on it. So whether we stay with it, we'll see. But th this is the phase where we're not backing out. We're past the first three. We're into the second three. We're catching it. So it, I mean, it, it tracks, I think, fairly well to create a process that, that there is this kind of journey that we go through and there's these kind of stages that we go through. Okay. Five is right in the middle. This is, this is the work. And if any uh, stage really has a, a longer time component, if any stage really uh, lasts for a while, especially in meditation, but also in drawing, it's the taming phase. So this is taming the ox, or I say taming the image. They line up really pretty well. I say just drawing, just drawing, just drawing. My attention is on technique building intuition, exploring possibilities, and improvising in the moment. So I'm working, I'm working the drawing, working the, I'm trying my best to use technique, I'm trying my best to render, I'm trying my best to shade, I'm trying my best to do whatever, but I'm also building up like what works for myself as I'm going. This is the, this is the middle work of the drawing as I'm, let, I'm, let, I'm trying to use my intuition. Where should it go? This is going, let me try this. I'm exploring possibilities. What if I shade here? What if I, what if this line goes here? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tame that. I'm trying to bring it into something. And, and how many times have I done a drawing and I get up to a certain point and then it's 
failing. Oh my God, it's failing. And then I have to bring it back and then it's back. And then I don't want to work on it because it's so good now. I don't want to ruin it. But then I work a little bit. Then I have to work with it. It goes back and forth. This is the taming phase. I'm going back and forth, trying to make it work, trying to move it, trying to discover it. This is what the, the uh, ox herding pictures say. Taming the ox, the whip and rope are necessary else he might stray off down some dusty road. Being well-trained, he becomes naturally gentle, then unfettered, he obeys his master. Okay, so the taming, the taming, the whip and the rope, that's when we talked about the uh, six perfections, right? The discipline and effort, that's the, that's the whip and the rope. We need, to, we need to be disciplined enough to show up uh, every day or show up at the time, and we need to be, be make the right effort to make the right drawing. We need to really try in the right way uh, to do it. And also patience is a big one here in taming. We need, to, we need to not think that we need, oh, we're not trying to get out of this phase. This, is, this actually may be where, where we, we live a lot of the time in this taming phase. We, a problem comes up, we decide to tackle it, we start doing it, we see how big it's going to be, and then we're into it. We're into this taming phase. We're right in the middle of it. Uh, and slowly, you know, we see change and we build up texture and we get a background that works and we get some shading that we like or uh, we figure out uh, what the real problem is that we're trying to fix something and oh, if we move this and now we need this part. So gradually we start to see, oh, it's starting to work, we get something going. So the taming, end of the taming phase is that, that we're moving toward a little more flow. We're, 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 the, the meditation that we sat down to do, that our mind was in a, a turmoil to do, again, this works on a one meditation and on every meditation on scale. That one that we sat down to do and we're in turmoil, in, you know, in 20 or 30 minutes, finally the mind quiets down and maybe we get a couple of seconds of, you know, really good, quiet time, or maybe we get longer uh, be, because we sat there. And maybe over the course of time, our meditations, you know, grow, flow stages grow in our meditation. So it can work on a longer time scale as well. Same with drawing, we build up our intuition and then our drawings become, become more complex. We have more confidence. So this is the taming phase. Okay, so now we're crossing. This is the, this is the third part of the middle. And this is the phase that uh, that uh, keeps us keeps keeps the loop going. <laughs> this is the phase that we we love, and we just notice that we love it. But each phase has something to teach. And this is the writing writing the creative flow. This is the flow stage, and this is where we finally like have enough mastery uh, of our craft that we can move through and uh, work with it. But even in a single drawing, you know, we're struggling, we're struggling, and finally we see what it's going to be, or we get an idea of it, and we start to shade, and, and we have a better sense of it, and we're in that flow, you know, and that it's, it's characterized a lot of times by, uh, you know, time just kind of disappearing, uh, even though we can be aware that we're working, you know, we don't, we're not really sensing uh, the passage of time because we're so focused on what's happening, we're so into this uh, intuition and decision making. Also, sometimes it can feel like uh, it's not you doing the drawing, uh, that, that somehow the drawing is being done through you. And I, I've heard this uh, uh, set of dancing too, that uh, uh, dancer, dancers will be, they're being, they're being danced. They're not dancing when they're in that flow state, but that, that flow can happen in lots of cases and lots of things that you're practiced in. You can reach a point where uh, uh, you've mastered the techniques and now you're starting to innovate with the techniques and you're cr creating new things. So I, for writing creative flow, I say beyond limits, pencil and line, creator and created dancing a dance. And I feel like there is this kind of dance between you and what's coming out or that moving that energy and, and you and the meditation or you and the, and the goal of your creative practice are sort of one and the same moving together. Uh, in uh, stage six of the ox herding pictures, it's called riding the ox home. And you can see the little guy on the back of the ox. He's, he's playing a flute. He's so comfortable. Uh, and the, the ox is so tame and he's so confident, so comfortable that he no longer has to guide him. He's play, he can play his musical instrument while he's going. So you're, you're free to create and, 
innovate and, uh, and the ox uh, there is, is part of it. They say, mounting the ox slowly, I return homeward. The voice of my flute intones through the evening, measuring with hand beats and pulsing harmony. I, I direct the endless rhythm. Whoever hears this melody will join me. So he points, he points to the outside just a little bit. So this is the end of the sort of doing phase. We had this kind of honeymoon decision-making one, two, three phase, and then in four, five, six, we're in the thick of it and doing it and moving through it. And that can be again on a single line, on a single drawing, or you know, throughout your maybe uh, career that you're learning it and then you're, you get good at it and you're in the flow of it. And that phase can last a long time as well. Uh, and also they allude in the asserting pictures to go going home this is the writing, they say riding the ox home. So he's, he's been on this journey and he's coming back. Okay. So here we are, seven, returning home. And you can see in the drawing, the ox herding picture, the little guy is at a house kind of resting and uh, in my drawing, uh, yeah, there I am kind of in front of a picture window on the cushion. And I call stage seven in the creative process, noticing the sense of completion. And that's a really interesting time. That's uh, a similar observation to when you're getting sucked into doing it, when you're kind of deciding to do it and you are all tormented and am I gonna do this or not? And you make the decision to do it. Noticing the sense of completion is when you got to let go. I say beauty resonates, not one line, one mark, one color, one word, one note, one thought, not one thing is out of place. And the question always comes up, like how do we know when we're done? If we're improvising, maybe you're improvising now. How do you know when a single line is done? How do you know when the drawing of the page is done? That's stage seven. Uh, and often I talk about uh, a practice that uh, was uh, that that I learned about from Shinzen Young, who's a really great teacher, and he's one of uh, he's one of these uh, pragmatic Buddhists who uh, looks at kind of the scientific side of works, how the mind works, and ties it in in very productive ways with practice. But he's also very deeply schooled in Buddhist practice. Okay, and his. Uh, and gone uh, process. It's a it's a noting technique, and we talked about noting early on just, uh, uh, what was coming up in our mind, and try to describe it in terms of our senses or whether it's a thought or not. Uh, and in this case, what we note is is gone. And he says, every time you are aware that something has vanished, note gone. So, if, for instance, if you're obsessed with something, instead of thinking about the thing that you're obsessed with. Try to watch and see when it's gone. Try to note when it's not there. It's useful in the drawing. Okay, when I'm trying to decide if a work is finished, I often look at the work, I gaze at the work, uh, and I just see if there if if there's any suggestion from say my nonverbal mind as a as a as a feeling or uh, as, a, as a reason, and I try uh, to just notice that. And when there are uh, no more things that I would do that disturb me about the drawing or that I would do to change the drawing, that's when I note gone, that, that all of those little uh, uh, objections, suggestions, or changes that are being suggested by whatever part of my uh, creative process uh, have quieted down, then I think, ah, I see a balance, uh, uh, nothing is out of place. And then, and then uh, maybe, that's, maybe that's done. In, uh, in the ox herding pictures, he says, uh, it's called the ox transcended. So in the ox herding pictures, it, it, the, and this is seven again, this is the first of, of, the, of, of the last three. So we had the, we had the, uh, getting into it, doing the work, and now this is kind of being able to understand and overview and release. So seven is the ox transcended. 
uh, and the ox again representing uh, our the meditation practice. Meditation practice is really not the thing in itself. It's not what we're. I mean, okay, we will. We want to master it, but we don't want to master it to be good at at meditation. We want to use that as a vehicle to get to this state. And so, in seven, after we've tamed the ox and ridden it home, uh, we we don't need the ox. We we're we're functioning in a in a way in a broader way. So. In seven, they say the ox transcended. Astride the ox, I reach home. I am serene. The ox too can rest. The dawn has come in blissful repose. Within my thatched dwelling, I have abandoned the whip and rope. So we're at peace there. That's a very nice sentiment that, that, that after the repose, what happens in, in my studio when, the draw, when I make the drawing, I put it up, I see a change, I put it up, I see a change. And there's a moment when there's no more things that I immediately want to change. Uh, that then I look at it, then I sit to look at it, and that's it's also the time that uh, uh, some of the reading gets done. The reading of the drawing starts in this uh, part when we now we're in a place where we're not pushing ourselves to do it. In fact, we can enjoy what we've done, uh, we can learn from what we've done, and we can just be with this thing, this drawing that we made. It's a part of our world now, and uh, there's great joy in that. Okay, so that's seven. Okay. Eight, the sort of middle of this phase. Drawing and self forgotten. The image I dreamed of is here before me and not here at all. The image and imaginer entangled. So, yeah, you have this thing, this idea that it's you making this drawing. And that kind of goes to the background and the vision that brought the drawing into being and the excited artist who couldn't wait to make the marks become this kind of wider view. Like now we're here at this thing. <coughs> Bless you. And the world, our world now contains this object. This is, this is the, the sort of the peaceful peak of the process that in fact, we're not in our own way and the meditation has brought us here. So the uh, ox herding pictures, ox and self transcended, whip, rope, person and ox all merge into no thing. This heaven is so vast, no message can stain it. How may a snowflake exist in a raging fire? Here are the footprints of the ancestors. So they get very esoteric. Ox <laughs> herding pictures at this point. This is this is the most uh, and the, and the drawing, the ox herding drawing, which I've, I'll flip back and can show you. But it's the Enso. Oh, there it is. It's, it's the open circle. It's just this open circle. It's this piece. So this is this is the. Uh, but in, in drawing, maybe there's that moment when you see the thing and you know, you, you, maybe you don't necessarily like it or don't like it, but maybe you do. Maybe in fact, there's something uh, uh, that elevates you. You know, you get that lift. I mean, you make a, a work, when I make a work that, that and but it happens to me every day. And it just, I'm like, where did this come from? There's, there's this beautiful thing and where did it come from? And here it is. And now it's part of my world. And there's another one and another one. It's, it's an amazing process. And, uh, and uh, I can just have them on my table here, you know, drawing after drawing. I'll show you some from today. Yeah, so, you know, drawing, it's flowers, there's another drawing, there's another drawing. Where did these come from? They're kind of, kind of amazes me. I mean, it should be, if you're enjoying yourself and they're coming out and there's no uh, shame or crime in just loving what you do. And thinking it's kind of this, and it's a record. When you go back and read it, you'll read all, you know, you'll read a whole history of what your day was like. When you see it a year from now, you'll remember what it was like a year ago. There's all this kind of information stored there. It's kind of it's this amazing process. And so in this, this stage is where it just kind of, you're, you and the drawing are, you're, you're, it's a, it's you on a piece of paper in a way, but you're not separate from this thing. You know, you, you, this encodes something about you. And it's, I mean, I haven't thrown them away. They, they stay as part of, part of who I am and what I am. If I give it to someone, it becomes part of me with someone. So 
this kind of transcendence happens in this in this uh, stage. We really we really see the process in a way. Okay. Uh, and now number nine. It's called sitting at the source or in the ox herding pictures reaching the source. Now, when it was originally put together, the oldest versions of the ox herding pictures that we find, it goes to eight. And then later nine, and then even later 10. Uh, but nine kind of completes the last three. So maybe it was done that way, I don't know. But, but nine starts to point you back to the beginning, just a little bit. Uh, and so you come out of that, I mean, you could end in that kind of blissful phase, phase maybe that's always just sitting in the cave and maybe there's a little bit more than sitting in the cave and uh, as we'll see next week uh, uh, as I was saying about putting up your drawings and sharing them that being part of a community and being part of uh, a sangha and being part of a group uh, that that is open enough and uh, safe enough and uh, trusting enough to share this kind of very open and vulnerable practice that comes out when you start to make work uh, yeah, is it an important part of this whole cycle? So, I, so I'm happy with this addition to the map uh, and we come back to the source. And this is the one place, because I thought when I first started writing about uh, the map and uh, designing it, and I had to really study it quite a bit, I got to this point and I thought eight was a peak and what could follow eight? Uh, and I really had to think about nine quite a bit. Uh, and uh, I, I say sitting at the source, seeing the path in perspective, hearing echoes from the journey, sitting in the studio, familiar surroundings are refreshed. So this is the kind of coming out of it. So I've had that moment of reverie and, and beauty, and then, uh, and then uh, I see the pencil again, and I see the paper, and I'm kind of coming back into the world. So how is that, uh, how is that the source? That's what I didn't understand on about what's the source of creativity, what's the source of creativity. Uh, and uh, what comes out from the map is that uh, the source of creativity is, is the world around us. <laughs> it's everything around us. It's this, it's this, if I could say it that way, not just the material physical things, but everything. The, the, what, what else could be the source for what comes through us, but everything that, that brings us into being. And so uh, in nine, we're, we're, we're coming back into the world and we're, we're returning uh, into the material and mental uh, structures that, that from which this drawing sprang, that, that is the source. In the uh, Oxharding pictures, they say, too many steps have been taking, taken, returning to the root and the source. Better to have been blind and deaf from the beginning. One's true abode, unconcerned with and without, the river flows tranquilly on, and the flowers are red. <laughs> so it's kind of saying you're back, to make the journey out to discover your true nature and your source, you can kind of rediscover the, the world. There's another saying that I really like, uh, which I have modified a little bit, but I'll say the, the beginning of that, the beginning of that uh, quote, it comes from the ninth century. Uh, and he says, uh, Queen Yuan, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, from the ninth century, <laughs> declared that there were three stages in his understanding of Dharma. The first stage, seeing mountain as mountain and water as water. The second stage, seeing mountain not as mountain and water not as water and the third stage seeing mountain still as mountain and water still as water and i think uh, maybe you could say the same about drawing in a couple of ways like when we undertake to draw a picture of a bottle or a picture of a cup it's a cup and we have this label on it and we say it's a cup and then we start to draw it and we notice the curve and we notice the light and we notice the texture and all of a sudden the cup is not the cup the cup is this kind of combination of things and reflections and uh, the light. And then when we kind of get it all drawn, we've understood it and we come to this conclusion and we return back to seeing it on the paper as a drawing. Yeah, now the cup is the cup again. And it can be the same with our pencils and our paper. Uh, when we draw our materials or our materials, but then they become something else. They become these instruments in our hands that are part of this whole flow. And then pencil down and it's a pencil again. So uh, in this return to the source is, uh, is uh, 
this is the place where that happens. <laughs> we reflect on that here. And the final stage, and you can see there's the old, old guy. He's like the Buddha looking guy. He's been up in the mountains and there's a new little guy he's handing something to. And 10 is a return to society, or as I say, return to the market. And the ox herding pictures say, barefooted and naked abreast, I mingle with the people of the world. My clothes are ragged and dust laden, and I am ever blissful. I use no magic to extend my life. Now before me, the dead trees become alive. So he's kind of goes back into the world as the map. But, uh, at the end of making a drawing, we come back into the world. At the end of each mark, we return back and start over again. We, we lift our pencil, we bring it back, we've made a decision, and we start that journey again. And in our lives, you know, we are untrained, we become good at something or practice something, uh, and then we reflect on it. And in the art world, especially uh, at the end of the process, after we've gone, we decided to make the drawing, we've gotten the materials, We've made the drawing, we've looked at the drawing, we like the drawing, okay, and then what do we do? We try to sell the drawing, believe me. <laughs> that's a return to the market. So that's, that's the, in the art world, it makes a lot of sense as well. It kind of goes out into the world, this, this drawing. And then we go back and uh, we start again. But not maybe because we have to, but mostly because the same curiosity takes over and we think, well, I made it that way. I wonder if I make it again a different way, how it will turn out. And so we get we get uh, curious again. And there we go. So I'll show you. That's the whole set of the of the but there are many versions of it, but that's the one that's the one with the little guys. If you look online, you'll see lots of more elaborate different versions. So it's a sort of rite of passage in some ways to make your own version. Okay, so I'm popping back to gallery view. Oh yeah, look at everybody, amazing. That's Griffin's here, cool. Griffin is uh, just joined the Facebook community, but he's an OG BYOP member. He was in, I think, one of the early, hey Griffin, he's in one of the early online retreats I did, so it's good to see you. John? Yeah. Um, question, the one through three and four, th Four through six, you gave a summary of, but what are seven through ten? Well, I think, uh, yeah, I think of seven, eight, and nine as a uh, as a kind of perspective overview. One, you know, we, we one, two, three, we're kind of getting into it, and four, five, six, we're doing it, and seven, eight, and nine, we're kind of evaluating, thinking about, uh, uh, integrating, uh, appreciating what we've done. And then 10, I think, is like bef like after the end, but before the beginning, I think when we kind of go back out into the world. And sometimes that phase, you know, the time we're not at the studio or the time we're not practicing, that can be a long phase as well. When we're out into the world. And one reason we call practice practice is because we sit on the cushion and practice for that time when we're out into the world. You know, we're, we're, learning, we're learning to uh, be centered and be out. And then in, in 10, we're, we're back in the world. And, and so I, I, I like it because it divides up logically that way, but mm -hmm. you can divide them up how you like. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, yeah, and I was gonna see if there were any other questions about the ox herding pictures. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, um, I'm quite curious <coughs> about the stage. Like, um, because the first few nine looks like really like internal process. And then the last one is going back to the market or the world that is integrated with others. Um, I mean, I, I assume that there's throughout the first nine uh, images that process that also, you know, um, some um, interaction with the market or the outside world, but in the end, it emphasize that kind of like complete return or something. Just wondering your comments on that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, because it, because the ox really represents the practice, 
whether it's a creative practice or a meditation practice, that it's, that it's, um, yeah, it's about where your attention is. And I think, yeah, a lot of times in meditation practice and in creative practice, your attention is inward. There's an introspective kind of practice that you're uh, oftentimes by yourself. And so it's, I think 10 is pointing out that connection to the rest of the world, but certainly you have people come to your studio or you uh, share drawings with people. And so 10 may actually come at, like I say, it's not exactly linear. So there might be a point when you discuss with someone in the world, whether or not you should buy the paints or whether you should buy the brushes. So you're, you're sort of in, in your internal phase, you're kind of at two, but in your, you know, you're also at 10 at the same time, because you need some reassurance or maybe, you know, you show someone a sketch and they approve it. So you could be at three or four, but, but also at 10. So, uh, so I, that's why I put 10 kind of outside the three groups as well, because it can kind of float around as you, I think as you're pointing out. And, and what do you think the motivation for return to the market or because it seems a quite nice internal journey that that boy could stay in that world for yeah. Valentine's Day. Well, uh, we, we do have practitioners that uh, stay in caves. That's a classic image, right? It's almost a stereotype of practice is that we're in a cave. Yeah. And uh, I think, well, more, uh, I thought about this today that you're pointing that out. Uh, the culture is different and times are different and the way we value the practice is different in culture. So, uh, and also I think that we have more people uh, and we live differently. So uh, these days I feel like we have more responsibility to, to interact. Uh, and I think that we, that we have more responsibility to, to uh, use the benefits of our practice to, to, you know, benefit others if we can. And that may mean, uh, doing something small or big, it, I, I think that can take any form. So I, I feel like uh, teaching uh, the class, for instance, benefits others. And so that's a practice that helps uh, perpetuate that. But I think also attending the class because it, it encourages me to learn, you know, it also benefits others. And I, I asked uh, Lee Brasington once, because I, when I first had a retreat with him and I was in a kind of a dilemma phase, can you believe after all these years, I was, re I really had a crisis in confidence about what I was making and why I was making it. And uh, that was, that was the way he uh, positioned it for me. And that's worked for me for quite a while is that uh, we make, we, we do creative work for the benefit of others. And it, it can also include ourselves, but to share these drawings is part of that. So, uh, that, you know, that's how I feel about the, about putting it out there. And I do feel like these days, because we could be self-indulgent, but I think it's harder these days and also we're more out in the world. And I think if we can uh, think, really open up and think about our place in the world and what our responsibilities are in culture, I think that you'll see that, yeah, you have a lot to offer. And I do think it is responsibility to, to yeah. bring it out and discuss it. Yeah, especially in the last drawing when that boy returned to the world um, where he met like this very happy, kind God figure that, that's like, you know, being kind of like um, being appreciated what he's got to offer rather than, you know, like someone who yeah. <laughs> or angry or like, especially the creative work sometimes or a lot of time for me feels quite vulnerable and and yeah quite even sharing with others can be quite fearful so it's really great to see that's how that boy ended <laughs> yeah i love that i love that observation yeah uh, uh this is certainly an optimistic picture but if you if you go into some of the writing more deeper writings you'll see they show the the each phase has some part of it that you can get caught on uh, like for instance, uh, in the third phase, when you're d discovering stuff, you can get caught up in discovering. So you just, you read a new book and you get a new guru and it's great. And then you get tired of that. And you go to the next one and you get caught in this phase, whether you never go deep into something. So when you look at the, at the, at this map, it goes much deeper. And there, like I say, there are books about it. So there are downsides and, and uh, warnings about each one. Yeah. But that's a really good one. Yeah. So sometimes you go back out into the market and, it, and it's not this warm reception. This picture certainly it certainly paints a better picture than that, but it's true. It's true. Yeah. And would I be able to find the details um, through that link you had on that page? That's where I find more details of the map. 
Yeah, that, it's, it's in a lot of places. I can, I can post when I put the video up tomorrow, I can put the link to the picture that I showed of all the 10 ox herding pictures. But John Dato Lori's book is quite good. Uh, also, I, I should point out that there's a lecture by um, Gil Fronstall, that, that, that one is on audio dharma. Gil Fronstall made a lecture about the ox herding pictures, which I'll put a link to as well. It's a beautiful 35 minute talk about them. And uh, from a meditation point of view, and I learned, uh, I've listened to that talk so many times. I learned a lot from him about the pictures. That was one of, the, one of the first times I understood the depth of it. But there's a tremendous depth in them. You can imagine it's a map that's been around for, for you know, a thousand years or something like that. It's been around for a long time. And there's a lot of depth in it. And I think it resonates with creative practice. I really, I think it resonates with a lot of, a lot of tasks that we undertake, uh, that we have this goal in mind and we have to overcome it. So. Um, I like to use it and I like the fact that it's described visually. So, um, okay, I'm going to, yeah, we're after time so I can l let everyone go, but I'm going to hang out uh, and do some drawing and also if people have questions, it's also good if they wanna hang out and draw, that's really good. Uh, so we're kind, of, we're kind of at the threshold now, of a changeover, because we're kind of at the end of drawing your own path uh, the uh, book side. There is a little section on uh, community and sharing and stuff that I will start to talk about, but I'm going to um, begin uh, talking about Christopher Alexander's work. So that's a little bit of a shift. Uh, and he's got these kind of universal principles of design, and you'll see how it ties in. It's still definitely meditative type work. And uh, this is the, somehow I imagined in the this was in January, February, when I was in the midst of putting my show together, which is, you know, now postponed with a lot of things in New York. Uh, I imagined sometime in the summer, I would get much more deeply into this work, this Christopher Alexander work. Uh, and I'll introduce it all. If you don't know too much about it, I'll give some links about it. Uh, but I'll, I'll do a little bit next week on the end of the book and, uh, and sharing and community, but I'll also like to call on everybody to participate in the community and put their work up and do a little more. That way, that'll be up to you. Uh, but I will, um, I, I'll spend some time on Christopher Alexander. Uh, uh, I, I don't know, I can't say too much about it. The Nature of Order is the, is the main book that, uh, that I'll be looking at. So if you wanna look for it, I think it's still around Amazon. It's expensive. I don't expect you necessarily everybody to buy it. It's actually in four volumes, they're four big volumes. Uh, this one's called The Nature of Order. I think you can find some of them online. I'm not actually sure if you can find it all online, but I will put up the necessary stuff and give you, uh, and what he goes through is something called the 15 properties in nature. And these are, this is the closest I've found to what I'd call like a universal design principle or a universal underlying way of thinking about creativity. Uh, and so, um, that, I think we should undertake that if you guys are interested. And I saw it more like up to now, I thought it's mostly like my workshops. This has been 14 weeks, almost 15 weeks, which is really a full, full semester of a college class, <laughs> as it turns out. So we're going to semester two now, guys. Uh, and uh, that won't be a final though. So don't worry, we 15. The, or the final will be put your drawing up and online. That's, that's your exam. Are you, are you brave enough? Uh, <laughs> some of you post very regularly, I know. Uh, yeah, so semester two, we're gonna look at universal principles. Christopher Alexander is at so, so much in depth, I don't know if we can get all through it. And also wanna have it a little bit more like a seminar. So I want more, a little more participation, but you don't have to, but if you're interested and you want, I would like more people to say more and be more a discussion. So I'll, there'll be maybe some more things to read, which I'll put up and, and a little more discussion of it, but I'll go through at the beginning with the 15 principles. So we won't get to that part still for a little bit. Uh, and that's V.S. Ramachandran, who also has kind of a set of universal principles. And I want to discuss some of his work and then we'll see uh, sort of what the interest is. It's, like I said, there's tons of good topics, but I think that uh, the way Christopher Alexander talks about um, artwork as a living thing, I think is worth, uh, as a group going through and trying to figure out uh, that I've never seen a, an analysis of it. I've never seen anyone. Uh, he was an architect. He did a lot in architecture and there are a lot of people active uh, about his architecture, but there are very few people active about what's in these books, The Nature of Order. So 
uh, I'm inviting you to that journey <laughs> and exploration, although I'll gu guide it as best I can and I'll be doing as much as I can to learn about it so that you, you guys will be really great motivation, I think, for me to, to work it out. Uh, okay, I'm going on too long about it. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. I appreciate it and it's been really great and I love the turnout. It's really encouraging. And uh, yeah, like I say, I'll hang out if you want to hang out and draw. And uh, otherwise, thank you and good night. Thank you. Thanks, John, very much. Nice meeting everyone.